Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you guys for coming. I'm, I'm glad that the, the skies parted for our, our talk and our artists this evening. Uh, I just wanted to do a quick hello. Uh, my name is Nathan Fox. I'm chair of the MFA Visual Narrative Program uh, here at SVA, as well as a, a graduate many eons ago when, when mechanical dinosaurs roamed the earth. Uh, and uh, Pan Terzis and I uh, were fortunate enough uh, a couple years ago to start up the Rezo Lab. Uh, and it is with great honor that I introduce him tonight. Uh, he's a, a printer, a publisher, an artist, illustrator. Uh, and uh, if you would please give a warm welcome to our lead tech, Pan Terzis. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you guys all for uh, coming out here tonight. Um, so uh, I'm really, really uh, pleased tonight to introduce two of our artists in residence um, in a program that we've only been really running since about uh, last, last spring unofficially and then, you know, running full throttle last summer. Um, you know, you're going to see the range of, of work, uh, you know, just, just seeing the difference between Natalie, Natalie Anderson's work and Greg Foley's work. I just want to say a few words about the Rezo Lab first, um, for those of you that are not aware. Um, it was founded in uh, the fall of 2015 as an interdisciplinary space for printing, publishing, and the production of Rezograph-based printed works. Um, and basically what we do is we offer classes, workshops, events, um, all kinds of things coming down the pipeline. So it's really an experimental place um, where we're trying to sort of become a hub of small scale and experimental printing and publishing activity, bringing together artists of all backgrounds and all disciplines um, to really encourage dialogue across different creative worlds. Um, a lot of you may be students and you may be specializing in, you know, different specific techniques. And, um, you know, the, the reality is once you get out, once you get out of school, um, you know, you end up working with people from all different kinds of fields, backgrounds, and um, what we're trying to do is really converge, uh, you know, create a space for a convergence of different ideas and different, different styles, um, you know, with, with print and with risograph printing in particular as, uh, as sort of a, a place for that to happen. Uh, we've got a bunch of events coming up that I want to let you guys know about. So, um, first of all, we have uh, the Print Slam. This is a photo of one of our previous Print Slam events. Uh, it's basically a sale that we do. It's a sale and an exhibition of student work. Um, so it's a chance to see all the work that's been produced by our students um, from our three continuing ed classes and our, um, our, our one uh, undergraduate class. Um, and it's also a chance to meet a lot of the creators and, and check out the lab itself and kind of see what we do. Um, uh, in addition, we have the deadline for our next artist in residence um, session. Uh, the deadline's coming up on uh, April 14th, so you still have a little bit of time to, um, to sort of submit, gather all your materials and submit what you need for that. Um, at this table over here, after the talk, uh, you'll be able to um, purchase, take a look at and purchase uh, some of the um, prints and, uh, and books that um, Greg and Natalie created during their residency. And we also have these, uh, these color charts, actually this is, it's great that the one I grabbed turned out to be uh, one that's wonderfully misregistered. So these kinds of things happen in Rezo printing, which, um, uh, you know, which usually they tend to be the ones that, that you want to throw in the garbage and everyone else uh, wants to get a hold of all the mistakes. But at any rate, these, these color charts uh, are free to, for you to take and it shows all the colors that we have at the lab. Uh, if you, you know, if you pick out one that's properly registered. On the flip side, it, uh, we have all our summer courses listed. So registration's open now um, for our classes. We're offering four Rezograph classes, including an intro class, a zine class, um, a mini comics class, and a new class taught by Paul John, or PJ, as some of you guys may know him, of a publishing house, Endless Editions, um, focusing on design and photography. Um, so that's... That's about it for me for now. Um, the, so Natalie's going to go first. Um, you know, our artists are going to go one after the other and present their work. And at the, at the end, we'll have a Q&A. Um, and you'll have a chance to ask Natalie and Greg and also myself any questions you might have, have about their process, about their work, about risograph printing. Um, so um, I'm going to introduce Natalie Andrewson, um, who's going to start off the evening. Uh, Hold off, I'm gonna just, you know, give you guys a little bit of back, background on exactly who she is and what she does. Um, Natalie Anderson is an illustrator and cartoonist uh, currently living in Brooklyn, New York. Um, she's worked on various projects such as book covers, magazines and newspaper illustrations, animation backgrounds, comics and posters. 
She's currently working on her first large-scale graphic novel, which is an adaptation of the original Nutcracker story for the, for, for, uh, the publisher First Second. She self-publishes comics and prints at the SFA Rizzo Lab, where she was an artist in residence in the fall of 2016, as you guys know and you'll hear about. And she likes to show work at comic conventions across the world, um, such as TCAF in Toronto, SPX, LCAF, and Kaigai Kai Manga Festa in Tokyo, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, and so if you guys want to give a warm welcome to Natalie Anderson. Cool, thank you, Pan, and thanks, Nathan, for having us out today. Um, this program has been like incredible for me. So overall, thank you. Um, cool, uh, and yeah, thanks for coming out uh, on this like disgusting turned wonderful day. Um, I was in thunder, a thunderstorm earlier trying to get here, so it's pretty great that you guys came out. Um, so my name is Natalie, and I've been um, working in comics and illustration for about four years now, um, since I gra graduated in 2000, or uh, 13, so three years, um, or f yes, four years. <laughs> anyway, um, and um, uh, let me just go through a quick bio. Um, I graduated uh, from school in 2013. I went to Ringling College of Art and Design. Um, and uh, comics weren't a huge part of my school. I know that you guys are most, um, if you guys are students here, there's like a comics program. But at Ringling, it was just illustration, and you really had to get into it um, yourself if you wanted, if you were interested. And so in 2000, like late 2013, when uh, I was about to graduate, me and my friend Ren asked for money to go up to TCAF because we were curious about what this cool indie publishing um, uh, convention was about. And it's um, in Toronto, and it's this beautiful festival with um, really incredible uh, self-publishers, small publishers, um, work that is just really nicely curated. Um, and so getting to, to see that when I was super young or you know, just becoming, just like starting my career was really important and has totally, like, totally shaped what I wanted to do. Um, and uh, so after school, I went back home. I knew I wanted to come to New York eventually, but I needed to save some money. Um, and so I did like odd jobs. I did some editorial work, but it really took a long time for me to like build up um, like my my uh, publishers and my like clients um, in order to gain some confidence in other art directors to work with them. So like it was really a snowball effect. Um, and then I was able to move to New York in uh, like mid 2014 or in March 2014. Um, and. Uh, because I had like been doing all these small jobs and saving so much money by staying at home, I was able to focus on um, creating stories in my spare time. Um, and I, that was always a, a big part of what, um, of keeping, I always wanted to make sure I spent time on that. I like saved some time for story um, like ideation. Um, my first self-published comic was called Man Atlanta, and I brought it to SPX uh, after I graduated. Um, and SPX is a small press expo. It's uh, right outside of Washington, D.C., and it's a huge um, comics festival for, uh, yeah, again, similar to TCAF, um, small publishers. Uh, and it's, it's just like a really good mix of people, really kind people. So I was bringing around this comic giving it to people that I, um, whose work I admired, um, friends, and it gave me the confidence to work on more. I mean, I really loved the story, but hearing feedback from people saying like, look, we would love to see this in color, um, you should pitch this around, was really, like, uh, was really great, was really inspiring, and um, I'm really glad that I did that and got some feedback from some of the people I admired. Um, the next, uh, like half a year later, for TCAF, the second time I went, um, I brought my first Rizzo printed comic, 
um, called Eris. Um, and it was an adventure comic, similar to Mamuena, which um, was also like an adventure comic, but more like, they're all kind of fantasy adventure. Um, and so I realized with the second comic, like, oh, I've got a theme. I like adventure comics. This is what I'm gonna go for. Um, I'm not gonna like just do diary comics or something. This is, uh, I figured it out. Um, so the first time I Rizzo printed was with my friend Ren's uh, home risograph. He had bought one like t a month earlier and we were still trying to figure it out. Um, risograph was just starting to become uh, a popular form of printing. Um, it seemed like uh, in 2014 and we thought it was really nice looking and we were tired of using Xerox, um, which is what I did for Mamuena. It was all like at Kinko's and I was kind of upset by how it came out. It's like, okay, it's my first comic. Um, it's gonna look kind of weird and bad. Um, uh, but then being able to use the Rizzo for the first time having something that looked more like a, like comics, like old comics or like manga, it was nice to have that texture and like something tactile to give out. Um, and actually, I sold this there. Um, so Ren's, Ren's Rizograph machine had two colors and we didn't really know how to register it properly. So I don't know if you can see, but she has like a circle in the middle of her face and that circle just went everywhere. Like the, it was completely off register. Um, if you see at the bottom, there's like this roller coaster thing, uh, which is a grid. Actually, I'm still, of course, learning how to draw, it still and at this point. Um, and and it's just a little bit off register. And that was like that was the nicest registration I could get with his machine. We had a really hard time figuring it out, and I think that it was just a huge learning experience for both of us. Um, and uh, I had to be okay with um, the red being off, like off registered from my purple, um, which is not always the case. I'll let you, I'll describe later. Um, so at TCAF, I met my book agent, Jen, and that began like a really good relationship of working consistently with book publishers and having like a very steady, comfortable, um, uh, like, um, uh, <laughs> oh my gosh, sorry, a really steady income. Um, and uh, so I was able to take on some book projects and then it was um, book projects, like, like once a month I would work on a giant project for like a couple, like a week. And then the rest of the time I had money to work on my own comics. And I, I would not have met her if I hadn't gone to TCAF. Like still, TCAF is such a big part of um, my career and um, yeah, just understanding what I want um, and wanted. Um, and so yeah, uh, again I moved to New York and I was doing a lot more editorial work um, as well as uh, book work and I just wanted to share a couple of like the random jobs I was working for the New York Times and sending out emails to Adweek um, and t Polygon, the game website, um, randomly contacted me to do a holiday gift guide. And so I was doing a lot of different things and my style kind of varied from project to project and I was still figuring things out, um, but like still staying relatively consistent. But one of, one of the things I like to do is to experiment as much as I can. And I was aware of that when I was working and I was stressed out about it. I was like, oh, I have all these different styles and I have all these different like, places I'm coming from. I'm supposed to find something uh, specific and like solid and stay on one track for editorial. And it really, it was stressing me out a little too much. So, um, I, so I started Lemon and Ket um, after like uh, in 2015, and with Piao Studio, who's one of the um, one of the uh, guys who run Piao is actually a teacher at the Rizzo Lab. His name is Patrick Crotty, and he's really he's really great. He's really 
Um, he worked with me a lot on this book. It was my first book to be sent to a publisher. It was, it was the first thing I, that um, I was going to print after Eris. Um, and I didn't actually print it, but like setting up the files and knowing exactly what to send him, um, I, I think I learned a lot with this book. Um, here are some pages from it. Um, but we decided to go with blue and orange in the, in the interior. And while I like loved um, Rizzo, I think I also learned from this book how tiny, tiny lines can get lost with this um, form and how to really like make this book what I want um, and make Rizzo what I want. Uh, so yeah, this another experiment and learning experience. Um, but ultimately, like my favorite thing I've done so far because it's the longest comic I've done so far. In between then and now, I've done just like a lot of short things, um, and yeah, still really proud of this like um, like six month project. I started working with Chris Mukai on her Rizograph printer um, after after I like a couple months after I moved to New York. Um, and she had been scanning, I had been using the, the machine uh, to only print on the scanning bed, which is much harder uh, with registration than printing from, straight from the computer. Um, and so I have, like, basically, I've had all of these trials and tribulations with Rizograph, <laughs> um, and not knowing, like, exactly what I was doing, and, like, kind of just learning from, like, project to project. Um, and uh, so this one was only a black and white uh, comic, but I really loved just how the black in the texture, or the texture in the black looked. Um, and that was also like, you know, I maybe now wish I had done either just one other color or some gradient in the black, because I understand a little bit more about Rizzo. Um, but basically, I've, Oh yeah, so Chris actually moved. Um, she moved away in, in February of 2016, um, and I was devastated because she, she took, um, she like left the Rizzo with uh, someone I don't really know, and I didn't feel comfortable asking them um, to work on it. And she would give me like discounts because I worked with her so much, and actually Rizzo printing with her was starting to become more expensive. This book was a 40-page book, and it cost me $200 to print. Not, not mentioning like the, the paper or the time that I took to print it. Um, so when the Rizzo Lab opened up, uh, suddenly I was able to print with different colors. It was um, easy to get to, like easy to learn because the machines weren't, you weren't scanning from the bed. It was scanning directly from your computer. Um, it was, uh, it was like came up at the perfect time because Chris was leaving. Um, and it was like the next step to my Rizzo journey. Um, and suddenly I became uh, much more confident with Rizograph printing. Um, so these are, some, these are some titles that I worked on. Um, and I have some up here, but this is, I was, I've been experimenting with um, form and like the best way to tell a, sh a short story and just as the fastest thing that I can make in the time that I have between projects um, and really like uh, pushing Rizzo to its limits um, or f my limits of Rizzo. Uh, and um, I have been publishing stories now for, oh, so for, um, I was working at the Rizzo Lab from uh, spring 2016 and a, and a bit in the summer 2016, and then in the fall, I began my residency. Um, and I was able to, uh, I, I dedicated my time that fall to uh, the Rizzo and being there. So I just like pumped out a ton of work and learned um, so much in such a short amount of time. Um, and uh, these are some pieces that I've been working on lately. Um, I started off, like, 
I showed you with Ren's Rizzo with, with two colors and like not understanding how to register it perfectly and getting upset when the registration wasn't right. And now I know like how to make, if the registration is off, um, like what kind of file, how to, to um, draw the file so that it's not devastating if it's off uh, register. Um, and how it can look cool if it's just a little bit off register. Like the, the dress in the girl, um, it's just a little bit off from the line. And that's, the, that's like the nice, um, like interesting part of Rizzo is that uh, the mistakes look cool. But basically I've been working with three color prints now instead of just two color prints and like overlapping them and tr really understanding what colors work well um, together. Um, and also like what kind, what forms I can, uh, I can work with and like create. So I did some uh, cards and like little greeting cards for a comic shop that I, um, that I'm cl I live close to, and the colors are crazy here. But um, uh, some like little spirit cards, and basically what what I would want. Um, but just like uh, I've never really had time to sit and experiment with work. It's always been like, oh, I'm in New York. I have to make money. I'm so stressed to make money. Um, and finally, like I've. I got a big project, a big book project, after like years and years of trying to um, make my own comics and make them viable and like uh, make money. Um, I finally got a big comic gig through my book agent, Jen, um, which is the nutcracker for, for a second. And so I got an advance uh, in the summer, which was nice, and then uh, which made me financially secure for the semester while uh, I did whatever I wanted on the Rizzo. Um, and the fact that the Rizzo Lab didn't charge for that semester, because it's the residency, also really helped. Um, and I was here like every week trying to use the time that I had um, to just print like anything I could. Um, stuff that looked awful. <laughs> Uh, that I won't show anyone, <laughs> um, and and stuff I like stuff that I really found out more about myself um, by printing uh, through printing. Um, like I I printed this, uh, and I learned more about what I like what kind of story I wanted. This this is a map. This is the the image, um, or this image is inspired by the book that I created for SPX called Mamuena. And the story like is kind of uh, always in limbo. I'm not really sure what I want to do with it. And then I made this, and I was like, I know exactly what I want to do now. And I pitched this image to Piao, the publisher that I worked with before. And I'm doing a, th a three, like a trilogy with them of this character now. And so like I, something maybe I would not have sat down and done if I hadn't had like the motivation and of like having you know a, a set amount of time um, to do uh, the project to do as much work as I could um, and and like so many other things that I would not have experimented with um, if I hadn't had this opportunity um, but yeah should I continue through until the slides can come up for you, Greg. Uh, maybe we can do a Q&A for you now. Yeah. What I have benefited from um, by uh, being a part of the residency, um, this was a residency, how it kind of works and um, how it's informed my work. Um, and it's because I'm doing like all like editorial work and book stuff, um, this project, or like not project, I consider like the residency the project, um, but um, it's gotten, it's made me a lot looser with my work. I understand a lot more about um, what kind of work I want to make. Like I've, I've always been kind of in this, in this state of hustle, like I need to just make something for an art director. I need it to be cool and I need it to, I need it, the art director to love it. Um, and for the first time since 
pretty much I graduated, I've had the space to experiment and to play, um, do something for myself. I learned during this residency that all I want to make work for is my seven-year-old self. If my, if like me as a seven-year-old would think it was cool, then it was a go, do it. Um, and I, um, and I realized uh, that this is a part of this. This is a part of my life that needs to stick around. I can't. I don't know if I can. Um, like I think you need just like maybe figure drawing on the weekend. Um, instead, like you need something else bes uh, besides your like money making job, and this has totally been. Uh, an immersive experience where I'm, I, for one minute, I can like only think about uh, the printing and the just like the science of it. What colors are going to work with this? It, it's something that um, that I'm able. To, I don't know that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that I I I have so much more confidence now. I think in my own style and my own work. Um, and creating so much stuff in such a little, like, short amount of time really helped with that. Um, yeah, I think my colors have changed, my palette. Um, my choices, I've, there's just a lot of learning, um, I think, that goes on during a residency. Um, and especially a printed one, yeah. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Alex? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually met Piao. Oh, so she asked uh, how I uh, started my re uh, my relationship with Piao, um, and what was working with, with them was like. Um, and I, I actually met Piao at TCAF. Another reason to go to TCAF. Uh, like kind of <laughs> started at TCAF, um, and we just uh, we enjoyed the same kind of work. And I think that I had like reached out to them online and said. Hey, like I saw you're coming to TCAF. I'd love to say hey. I'd love to show you my work. And then we ended up going out to ice cream, and we were like friends. <laughs> After that, it was really. But they were also brand new, um, and uh, it was, it was, they were from Sweden, um, and I think that us being like both foreigners at TCAF um, was a, a really fun experience to be with them, to do that. Um, but uh, so we were friends, and then suddenly we had to work together professionally. And I was like, oh, I, I'm just going to send you my images whenever. And they're like, no, we have a set time. We're friends, but you need to like, be on top of your deadlines. We have a, a time when we need to print. Um, we're going to promote this so that we're going to have it out at this convention. Um, here, And they edited my story. They helped me work it out so that it made a little bit more sense, which is great. Um, and uh, it was really, it was a really positive experience going from just being friends um, to a like, professional relationship. Um, and even now, uh, with pitching the story, Mamuana, and like, uh, wanting to do a trilogy with them, I'm still like pulling this like, hey, I'm really busy. Can I just send these to you whenever? And they're like, no, we're going to Skype. And we're going to figure out the deadline. <laughs> and we're going um, we're gonna to work out exactly what colors and what, what type of book you want. One, th one cool thing about um, Piao is that you have a lot of, um, you have a, have a lot of room to work with. Or they give you a lot of room um, to do what you want. And they are, they're not editing like crazy. I think a lot of other publishers will say like, oh, you know, you can't have this uh, person in this book because it do, it's just not, it's just not what we're looking for. It just doesn't sell. And with Piao, it was very much, yeah, whatever you want, we're passionate if you're passionate. Um, and um, ooh, I think that, uh, yeah, I had like total control over the size of the book and how many pages I wanted it to be and um, how elaborate I wanted it to be. They were so excited about um, any form that I wanted to make. Um, 
so yeah, it was really positive and really open, and I wish like that this is how working with publishers was, um, and I think it is. I, this is my first time working with like a very large publisher, but so far, you know, it's there. I'm working with First Second, and they have a specific set of book um, sizes that they produce. It's not just yeah, let's go with like super long book and see if that works. It's under a giant. Um, uh, publisher Macmillan, and so they have set rules they need to follow. And um, but yeah, like working with small publishers like Annie Koyama, um, Youth in Decline, Piao, it's uh, I mean definitely pitch to them or make your own publishing <laughs> house if you want. Um, like publish your own work uh, because it's it's so fun and like important to have. Um, your own piece, like your own curated. Okay, so so like producing something completely on your own, um, self-publishing, and like working with small publishers uh, is just like a different. You you're completely in charge. In charge. You're it's totally your own content. Um, it's something that you like. You can feel so proud of at the end because you worked every like at every step of the way. You didn't just send off the images and like say bye, I guess they'll come out nice. Um, you're, yeah, talking with them at every point. And yeah, it's really positive. Um, and that's another reason why I work with Rizzo so much is because I'm kind of a control freak. I kind of want to know what, like I, I want to make my work look nice and I want to publish my own work. Um, and uh, just have like a space for me to throw out any stories um, and any thoughts I have and kind of just like get it out into the world and like a blog, but you don't get comments back. You don't, or you know, if you ask or if you send it to reviews, you do. But it's not like, on, on a blog, you can't, you don't have control over the format. On Tumblr, it's Tumblr's format. Here, it's entirely your own format. You can. Um, do what, whatever, co like colors, whatever, well, the colors that we have now, <laughs> whatever paper you want, um, uh, and really design every aspect of it, and um, yeah, I think it's good. Cool. Uh, I think we had a couple more questions, maybe. Any others? Did you have a question? environment of the residency is like? Is oh, yeah. Like, is it just you and the machine? <laughs> oh, yeah. like you and other people? Are there other artists at the same time? Like, who did you interact with during your residency, and what was that like? Um, I, so you're working with other, OK, so you have two machines in the room. Um, and in order to like help everyone get time in, at the Rizzo Lab, uh, you have a sign-up sheet for um, a specific time and which Rizzo printer you want to use or machine you want to use. So I'm, you have like five hours a week um, or four uh, to, to print and uh, every week you can either, um, you can sign up or you can take a week off. Oh, there we go, cool. Back in business. Back in business. You can take a week off to uh, produce a lot of work and then um, maybe have two hours here and then three hours the next week. Um, it's and and you're in uh, the lab with another person at the other machine mostly the whole time. So it's it's a small space, but it's intimate in a good way. You're talking with the other person who's printing. You have a technician there that is at like any your beck and call um, anything you need, and uh, they really. Like I, so coming from Chris Mukai's machine, which is a one drum machine, um, these ones are two drums, I was very nervous. I didn't want to mess up anything, or like, they're kind of delicate. Um, they're, they're extremely delicate. <laughs> like they're, um, and, uh, or at least Chris's was. Now I'm realizing like, oh, I have a lot more, I understand the machine more, so I'm not as afraid of it. And that's what the Rizzo Lab really helped me do. I'm more confident with the machines, um, and I, I feel like I have a community here that I can 
ask questions um, to and like uh, get like positive feedback. Um, yeah, and and so when you sign up for this um, residency or for any like class, you get full access to the machines um, wi within the time. And uh, so that means you have unlimited masters, which are is a screen that goes on top of the um, the printing drum, and it's kind of like the screen and screen printing. You're burning onto that image. You're burning the image onto the screen. Um, <laughs> I'm like looking at Pan. He's got a way better way of saying this. But um, you have unlimited masters, unlimited, unlimited, unlimited uh, color, and like ink, um, which is with Chris Mukai, when I printed with her, it was like 10 cents or 20 cents a master. So I had to be like, you know, still I understand how expensive masters are because of that. <coughs> so I try and keep them like uh, very, con I'm, try I, I'm very conservative with them. But also, I'm able to still, you know, not be nervous. Like, oh, it's 20 cents per thing. Like, I can't, I can't mess up. I can't. I'm not. There's no anxiety behind working here. It's just like a flat fee, and I do as much as I can in that time. Um, yeah. These were this. This was a card. These were little um, warrior spirits. Just just to like try, like will those sell, do I like them? Um, and turns out like I, it's fun to just draw girls that are super tough with weird magical powers. Um, and then these ones on the lower uh, image are style cards, so like who represents you the most? Um, and there's all these faces and it's a series that I wanna continue, but was also like totally a last minute, like I have this paper what am I going to draw on it? Um, whatever comes out first is what I, what obviously I want. Um, I'm working with the Nutcracker. That's an image from the promo for it. Um, and then I pitched uh, this trilogy for Piao, and I'm also pitching to No Brow. So it's like things are just snowballing. Where at the um, I think now with like being at so many conventions and having access to a printer so I can print so many more of um, my stories. I, yeah, have, I have tons of content now that I'm pitching to publishers um, that I don't have a whole lot of work to do because I already have that content. Um, and yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Natalie. So, um, so up next, um, you're going to hear from an artist who, um, who's coming at this from a completely different um, uh, place than Natalie, although they do overlap in some areas. Um, so Greg Foley designs and creative directs Visionaire, uh, the magazine V, V Magazine, which I'm sure some of you have seen on newsstands. I know I've been seeing it for years. Um, v Man and V Files. He's a Grammy-nominated album cover designer uh, the author illustrated the children's ser book series, Thank You, Bear, and a contributing artist for The New Yorker. Um, so it's, uh, why don't we give a warm welcome to Greg Foley. Thanks, Natalie, for all her great work, and Pan, Joan, and Nathan of the Reiser Lab and the Visual Narrative MFA. Um, like most creatives, I do a lot of different things. Uh, I started as a fashion design major at RISD. Over the course of my career, uh, I've done a lot of art direction and creative direction for branding and fashion, music, hotels, uh, and publishing. I am also the children's author. I have eight, uh, scratch that, nine books. I'm working on my ninth book now. It's called Cat Writes a Song, and it'll be out next year. Uh, I've taught publication design at Parsons, a course called the visual story for about 15 years. And now I've just completed uh, artist in residence, residency, uh, where I made uh, an edition of original prints called Lux Ex Tenebris. Um, Lux Ex Tenebris means light from darkness. And it also happens to be the motto of the US Cyber Defense Department. That's why I like it. Um, so I'm gonna discuss a little bit about my history in print 
uh, and how that translates to the edition and my process for completing it. Uh, one of the defining elements of my career has been to shape Visionaire, which is a collectible publication. Uh, it breaks all the rules of publishing, offering full creative freedom to uh, its contributors, and it challenges the literal form and expectation of a physical publication. Uh, for example, we've attacked the census directly with a scent issue. Uh, we've made toys that you can touch and play with. Um, we've done a sound issue of all one minute songs from everybody uh, from like um, uh, U2 to experimental artists. Um, we've done an issue entirely made out of metal, pressed metal, and um, we broke a Guinness Book of World Record making the largest magazine ever printed, which was seven by five feet. That, that record's been broken since then, but. Uh, along the way, I've worked on a lot of more conventional pop culture projects, from sneakers to magazines, like V Magazine, Pan mentioned. Um, also club flyers and album covers, practically anything that I could uh, be allowed to do, I would say yes to and do. And um, I got to inadvertently work on a lot of the same things that informed me from my youngest age. Uh, at a certain point, it brought me full circle to literal storytelling and um, I went back to school for writing and started uh, writing and, and illustrating children's books. And ironically, it expanded uh, my understanding of story uh, in all of the projects that I've worked on. Uh, it also brought me back to illustration. Um, this is a cover for New Yorker that I got to do a couple of years ago for the style issue. And this is an upcoming book that'll be out next month. Uh, called Cool Style, Sound, and Subversion, and it's the first comprehensive history of style subcultures and musical movements uh, covering the last 100 years. Um, but I've also, uh, in the last couple of years, started making fine art again. And to me, fine art is kind of like a, an even more formal study uh, of subject and process. And after all the experience I've had in different um, art media, I began exploring strictly color, which was really refreshing for me to get away from illustrating things and uh, sequencing narratives and stuff like that, just to, just to purely think about color. Um, and the first experiments I did were actually just for a social platform called Elo.co, if any of you guys know it. It's a really good app now, too, and it's great for um, uh, visual artists or designers. Um, uh, there's no advertising and all that stuff. Anyway, I have an account on there and it had some of the earliest experiments I was making just digitally. Uh, but as the series uh, began, I was just stealing color and light from uh, photos of places that I had been. Um, I was born in the Philippines, so this is um, based on colors from a photograph of uh, Angeles in the Philippines. Um, and I would just um, keep it simple and uh, it was just about the quality of light um, and I began to consider them photographs since I was stealing the light and the color from photographs and then making them into new pieces by blending layers of color and grain. Uh, this is a piece uh, based on where I grew up in Austin, Texas. Uh, and then this is a piece um, based on a couple of years I spent in the UK as a teenager, uh, Reading, England is a good industrial town about an hour outside of London. Um, but as I was making these pieces, there was interest in um, people to buy uh, them, and I had to consider how I would want to print them. That's, that's about when I realized I should just call them photographs, and then I uh, experimented printing them in different photographic modes, uh, you know, using the cutting edge um, Epson you know, uh, print technologies, and um, moving on to printing with, uh, this is a, a dye sublimation piece. This, this is about the limit of where I'm at with these photos now. Um, getting larger and larger in scale, and this is a chromalux material that's aluminum backed, and they use dye sublimation to embed the photograph onto the enamel and then I had it CNC cut into a circle, so it's the shape of the piece. This is still missing the um, raw aluminum struts on the back, so you can either hang it on the wall or lean it. Um, 
So um, after I applied uh, to do the Rise of Lab Artist Residency, I realized to make risographs, uh, I probably better take a slightly different approach to where I'm getting my um, colors. And uh, I decided to make the edition that I wanted to do at the residency a uh, kind of a personal history in print, um, sampling all of the media that has shaped my perspective. Um, this is the poster for the workshop that I did as part of the artist residency. If you're if you apply for the residency and you're accepted, you uh, have a few different things that you have to do other than make your work is um, do a workshop. And so for my workshop, I sort of laid out what I planned to do and um, took about 12 or 15 people through the process of using the machines. We did a quick training. That's a sample of work that one of the attendees made. Um, all of them were good. Every person who came did a really nice piece. I wish I had documented them all. They were a lot of fun. Um, but for my own work, what was a little less fun was the rigorous process that I adopted. Um, in order to make the edition as much of a fine art piece as possible, I sorted all of the paper that I used for flaws. I, I chose to use an 80-pound uh, toothy uh, acid-free stock that was recommended to me by people who had used the machines and said this this kind of thing will jam this kind of thing doesn't take ink well um, and so I kind of just ran with what they suggested um, so in any run of paper in a ream there will be little specks and spots and things and I couldn't have any of that because I needed every print to be pristine so I would literally sort through stacks of paper, finding, looking at both sides, and if one side was clear, I would go ahead and accept that, even if there was a piece of grain on the other. And this went on for hours. Uh, resulting in organized stacks of 10 sheets each, because I had to make sure that I had enough paper to make, uh, I decided to do 100 copies of what I was going to make. 20 prints, 100 copies of each. And so you have to have extra because there's mistakes all along the way. And um, as I learned using the machine and making every mistake possible, uh, you have to stay really organized. Um, these are some of the things that I discovered along the way. So step by step, I made endless mistakes. Uh, it's really difficult using an industrial machine to try and make something uh, pristine. Um, this is an example of some, this is just two of the colors separated. Uh, and after a certain number of prints, in my case I found after about 20 to 25 prints, you would start getting a jammed up screen. And this is the result after about 25 prints. And then I would have to make new masters, and then the masters are smooth again. And that, the result on the left is really what I was after, sort of a soft focus blurry effect. So I'd have to stop, make a new master, check the registration, start printing again. And you can imagine with jams happening every so often, this goes on forever. Uh, this is an example of gripper marks that happen inadvertently when you're using the machines. And they happen to fall exactly on the tips of my uh, composition so I had to learn how to shift things around or lay the ink in a certain way in order to avoid those things um, basically learning how to use the machines to try and achieve the results I wanted um, I started using a basic emulation of CMYK and on these machines they have a really bright fluorescent yellow they have a fluorescent pink which is even better than magenta uh, for people who don't know CMYK is cyan magenta K is black and uh, yellow, and K is black. And for the printers, you have to go uh, dark over light. Because the light ink, if it goes down first, then it will resist the dark ink, and it won't be as rich as possible. So, and, and it's a soy-based ink, and so it never really dries. And so 
I would have to start a myriad of pieces with the first two colors that I could spit through one pass of the machine and build up my stack and then put those aside for at least a week before I could print the second part or the whatever else I wanted to put on them. And much to my dismay, I realized that when they said it never dries, it really never dries. And so I had, at a certain point, stacks of pieces like this. And this was a hard lesson to learn about staying organized and labeling everything because at the same time, I would start some blue and black ones. So that was the yellow and pink, and this is the blue and the black. I didn't know which thing was which at a certain point, and it was like, you know. So I had to go back and cross-reference my files, and I don't have an example of it here, but the files are all black because it's not the ink that's printing. Everything that you're looking at on screen is black. Um, so other than CMYK, uh, some of the things that I did do have uh, three colors, and some of them have six. There are parts where I did additional bumps of red or uh, black to make it richer, or a fluorescent boost, a second hit of something. And thankfully, uh, I was allowed to come into the lab early in January before the semester started, and it was the greatest experience I've had in years. Like Natalie said, um, it was like going back to school again and going in on a weekend when nobody wants to be there and having the whole place to yourself. I got to spread out and test um, what I call the moving sun technique for drying, uh, trying to rush dry the things so that I could put them through the printer again because it's, it's hard to co complete that many prints. I, th I think that's at least 2,100, maybe 2,500 prints that I, I made in the course of the time that I was there um, in the limited time available. Um, so I want to give you a preview of some of the, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, show you some of the um, behind the scenes where I took the colors from for some of the pieces. I won't show the entire, uh, I won't reveal all my sources, but this was a piece that was based on where the wild things are. And I titled them the same. It's, uh, you know, where the wild things are after Marie Sendak. Uh, this was a BMX action magazine that meant a lot to me. When I was a uh, 12 or 13, I built BMX bikes in the 80s. and. Um, when I went back and got this copy so that I could study it, I realized that the whole thing had this recurring primary color scheme. Like They would market everything in the same color scheme just so you could have an all-matching bike and outfit. And so the resulting piece reflects that. Um, the pieces kind of translate into a sense memory of an age and a time. This to me is 1983. Uh, I got to translate favorite objects and influences. So this was a, a big moment in X-Men comics for me. And this is my sense memory of it. This is one of my favorite Basquiat pieces called Notary. It's a detail of it. Um, sorry, it's so low res. And this got to push the work that I was making before that was almost strictly daylight uh, into new places. Um, also in the process, I was excited to touch on all kinds of iconic cultural references that I expanded my worldview. This is Bill Trailer. Uh, when I first saw the book American Self-Taught, it changed everything for me because it had just come off of an age of Basquiat being the like reigning Picasso of the 80s, like his naive style. And then you go back and you look at somebody who's self-taught like Bill Trailer, who always worked on natural board in blues and blacks. And so that's my piece. And getting to the edges of appropriation by citing uh, really famous historical art references like Agnes Martin. Also pushing the dynamics of really faint imagery and to reconnect with some of my you know, big influences like Ed Ruscha or Joseph Albers or Mark Rothko, which a lot of people say that the work I'm doing reminds them of.
and um, to resurrect thinking. That for me, when I first discovered it was so ahead of its time, like this is from the 60s, and Vassarelli, who's an optic artist, was one of the first people to be using fluorescent colors and things that I think, you know, look so gifster now. Uh, in the end, the edition ended up being a wild mix of cultural references, uh, and it was a real challenge to curate and edit it. I made a lot more pieces than ended up in there. I uh, just didn't like the way that they were either coming out or the way that they went with each other. Um, and it was a challenge to collate them uh, into one edition. Uh, I ended up uh, deciding to make a custom portfolio to package everything in. Uh, this is the title emboss and um, I designed a seal that could uh, be hand stamped in the corner of every sheet because I thought it would be pretty gauche to have my signature on every page. Also, I wouldn't want to sit there signing everything. So uh, this is the finished piece documented and I, I brought one copy. I, I don't know if we have a whole copy, but we have some of the loose prints. Um, I'm planning on showing these if I can um, as drawings, just like the other ones are photographs. I think it's you know, fair to call these drawings their original prints. Uh, they're paginated and organized somewhat chronologically. It happens to have a natural soft beginning because these are all based on children's comics and the one on the left there is Peanuts, Sunday Comics by Charles Schultz. And then it gets a little bit brighter and bolder. It's funny because these are the, the things that were adolescent interests to me. Um, the BMX action X-Men. That's a hobby Japan and on the far left is a July uh, 1970 Playboy. Um, and then in the pagination, I wanted to have some surprising turns so I just kind of jump cut Vassarelli's in there to break things up because I felt like it got a little, a little slow in that bit. And then to me, when you're turning pages, you always want to have variety to wake up the eye. And then I decided to pair the two monochromatic ones together and then have a strong finish at the end. Uh, so everything's totally collated now. And I've handed over another thing about the residency is you are technically supposed to give 20% of what you make to the Riso Lab so that they can sell it for fundraising. Um, we worked out a deal so that I, because the things that I made, um, they're technically supposed to be gallery or, um, you know, a dealer price of $1,500, which is quite a bit more than your typical zine, you know. And, um, the individual prints, I don't know, I guess it can be flexible how they're sold, but uh, I only get half of that if somebody sells them, you know. So uh, I gave a lot of finished editions and loose sheets to the Riso lab so that they have uh, the ability to sell them any way they want. Um, and I still have quite a few left to hand stamp. Uh, this was the full scope of the 20 prints, uh, 100 copies of each. I didn't have a picture of it. It doesn't come off quite as well, but they have some of these that you can buy. Um, the colophone version, it has an explanation of what the edition is, and it has a place for me to number and sign this page by hand. But this piece, I just moved it over and took the numbering off, so they could sell them. And it has a catalog of all of the pieces and the titles of each. This is what I ended up doing. What I presented at that workshop halfway through the semester was completely different. But um, they say that they're going to get an uh, 18 by 20 inch risograph. They're working on it. And I hope I get invited back so I can um, make some more and fill in some of the gaps, uh, uh, maybe with some new things that I discover along the way. Thanks again for coming. So now we're going to open it up for uh, questions, if you want to just uh, hang out here. What, what initially drew you to the Rizzo? It's because it's another super unique uh, print process. You know, I know silk screening. I've done silk screening. I had never, so I mean, you know, Natalie had used 
different forms of risographs before. I had never touched one until they, you know, invited me, accepted me into the program, and then we had to do three different days of training. So there were days that, I mean, you, you go in there and you spend four hours just setting up, and then you have an hour to try and eke out something, you know? But it's really special, you know, process. Yeah, I, I think to add to that, um, it's really, you, like, going in, does this, is this working? Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, going in and like understanding how long you're going to have to take to print is also a learning curve. At first you're like, okay, how do I even send this, um, this print from computer to, uh, the machine and I print all digitally. So it just, I don't, I'm, and I make my work, um, all digitally. So, um, sitting and like making sure it's, uh, like the color, like, yeah. Um, Everything <laughs> oh that can go wrong will go wrong. Yeah, it will go wrong. And, and then, like, being prepared for those, for those um, times where, you know, okay, one thing, that color that you wanted to use, it's not working today. And that doesn't happen very often. Um, where uh, at, like, other uh, either printers or, um, at, like, your friend's risograph, that happens all the time with Chris's, it happened all the time, um, and uh, and you're you're you have to be prepared to like just spontaneously like uh, work it out and um, and try something new, and most of the time you get exactly what you want, and sometimes there's like special fun experiments that come that go along with printing. Um, I had to abandon a couple of pieces because the blue drum, <laughs> this is like, the blue drum in the lab has a ding in one corner of it. And if you're doing, um, uh, if you're doing something that's representational in line drawing in a pictograph, you're not going to notice it so much, but because the things I was doing were like floods of soft field, it just, like, it would have this funny mark in the corner, and so I had to stop doing that piece. This has a funny mark in the corner. Yeah, right it's there. A, but I think it's cool. It has like, so I do the same thing, this grain touch. Um, I do the grain touch on, like exclusively. Um, and I, I have, I do a lot of work in blue. It's right now like the darkest color um, besides black or a teal is just a little bit lighter, but I really like how deep the blue is and how um, saturated it is as well. Um, but yeah, it has this like kind of funny, uh, spot to it um, that I think looks like water <laughs> and it, I think looks really interesting and that's totally been a part of yeah I mean um, it's totally been a part of like the choices that I've made um, and uh, like I don't know it looks it looks handmade hand printed you're as if you had like colored it um, yourself uh, and that's a big draw for the riso la uh, for the risograph for me is that everything looks really traditional. Um, gradients look like Japanese woodblock prints. Um, they're like this. I've been doing a lot of gradient work, maybe not this, but like especially with certain types of paper, with darker paper, you can get really, really nice gradients that are really pleasing and something you can't just get from like your Kinko's machine printer or, um, and also, I, I don't know how to screen print. I've never screen printed before, um, and but it sounds super scary. <laughs> it sounds. I mean, it's. <laughs> yeah, you could. Um, it doesn't sound scary. It's just like sounds like a lot of work and um, <laughs> a lot less work than this, <laughs> maybe. Um, uh, you, go ahead. Uh, I just want to jump in. So as far as you know, as far as the connection to printmaking, I think it's really interesting to. Um, you know, how Rezo relates in the printmaking world. Um, you know, it's something that's just sort of emerged on the scene. These machines, you know, some of you may know this, some of you don't, um, they were never designed for artists. They were designed as sort of a fast and dirty industrial printing uh, workhorse that was marketed to churches, schools, offices, you know, law firms. And, it, you know, um, these things, they basically, they get, they get, you know, used for years and kind of, um, you know, they end up, on the secondhand market, and artists started finding them and buying them for cheap, figuring out how to fix them, and bring them this in their studios and starting to use them in their in their publishing practice. Um, so, 
you know, as this form of printing, you know, sort of came on the scene, uh, some people in printmaking, um, you know, may 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 have felt a bit a bit threatened, or, you know, is this going to replace screen printing? It, I think it complements it. And I think it's a segue. You can go back and forth from traditional printing, um, you know, into riso printing. You know, when I discovered the medium, I applied everything I knew from printmaking. Um, you know, into the process, but I, I also, I encourage my students after they, they take a Rezo printing class to also look into screen printing, and you know, I'd recommend, I mean, it's okay. it's scary, but uh, but it's worth it, you know, because Rezo printing, you know, it cuts out the learning curve, um, but it can also open up your world to just think about printing in general, you know, yeah. and kind of dip your dip your toe in printing and get kind of hooked and then try something bigger. Or if you, if you have experience in, in screen printing, you know, sort of taking that knowledge and applying it to Rezo. Um, in like a concentrated industrial form, so I think I think all these different forms sort of can coexist and co and complement each other. Definitely, I think that because I started with Rizzo because it was really accessible, and I didn't have access to a screen printing lab. It sound it was very expensive, and when I w just went to print with friends, it was like fifty dollars here to make a giant book, and uh, and I'm working with them like closely. I don't know. Um, it was a lot cheaper, and it was a lot. Um, uh, faster, it's uh, for for me. Um, Do we have any other questions? I'm totally into going from from now here to screen printing, though. Yeah, my base. All right. Well, um, so any, any other questions before we uh, we wrap it up? And then, if any of you have any questions that you want to ask uh, Greg and Natalie individually or myself. Um, you know, uh, we'll have a little bit of time now. If you want to take a look up close at some of the work that they made, um, I want to thank you guys all for coming out. Um, uh, once again, these color charts we have are free for you to take, um, and we have. Uh, there's still a bit more time to apply for the artist in residency program. You can ask me about deta details about what that involves, and you know what you'll be expected to do, and. Um, you know, any of that kind of stuff. And also, we've got a few other events. All the events are also listed on the color charts as well um, on the back. So any last questions? No? All right, thank you guys for coming out. Let's give a round to Natalie and Greg. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you guys for coming. I'm, I'm glad that the, the skies parted for our, our talk and our artists this evening. Uh, I just wanted to do a quick hello. Uh, my name is Nathan Fox. I'm chair of the MFA Visual Narrative Program uh, here at SVA, as well as a, a graduate many eons ago when, when mechanical dinosaurs roamed the earth. Uh, and uh, Pan Terzis and I uh, were fortunate enough uh, a couple years ago to start up the Rezo Lab. Uh, and it is with great honor that I introduce him tonight. Uh, he's a, a printer, a publisher, an artist, illustrator. Uh, and uh, if you would please give a warm welcome to our lead tech, Pan Terzis. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you guys all for uh, coming out here tonight. Um, so uh, I'm really, really uh, pleased tonight to introduce two of our artists in residence um, in a program that we've only been really running since about uh, last last spring unofficially and then you know running full throttle last summer um, you know you're gonna see the range of, of work uh, you know just just seeing the difference between Natalie Natalie Anderson's work and Greg Foley's work I just want to say a few words about the Rezo Lab first um, for those of you that are not aware um, it was founded in uh, the fall of 2015 as an interdisciplinary space for printing publishing and the production of resograph based printed works um, and basically what we do is we offer classes, workshops, events, um, all kinds of things coming down the pipeline. So it's really an experimental place um, where we're trying to sort of become a hub of small scale and experimental printing and publishing activity, bringing together artists of all backgrounds and all disciplines um, to really encourage dialogue across different creative worlds. Um, a lot of you may be students and you may be specializing in you know, different specific techniques and um, you know the, the reality is once you get out once you get out of school, um, you know you end up working with people from all different kinds of fields, backgrounds, and um, what we're trying to do is really converge, uh, you know, create a space for a convergence of different ideas and different different styles, um, you know, with with print and with resograph printing in particular, as uh, as sort of a, a place for that to happen. 
Uh, we've got a bunch of events coming up that I want to let you guys know about. So um, first of all, we have uh, the Prince Slam. This is a photo of one of our previous Prince Slam events. Uh, it's basically a sale that we do. It's a sale and an exhibition of student work. Um, so it's a chance to see all the work that's been produced by our students um, from our three continuing ed classes and our, um, our, our one uh, undergraduate class. Um, and it's also a chance to meet a lot of the creators and, and check out the lab itself and kind of see what we do. Um, uh, in addition, we have the deadline for our next artist in residence um, session. Uh, the deadline's coming up on uh, April 14th, so you still have a little bit of time to, um, to sort of submit, gather all your materials and submit what you need for that. Um, at this table over here, after the talk, uh, you'll be able to um, purchase, take a look at and purchase uh, some of the um, prints and, uh, and books that um, Greg and Natalie created during their residency. And we also have these, uh, these color charts. Actually, this is, it's great that the one I grabbed turned out to be uh, one that's wonderfully misregistered. So these kinds of things happen in Rezo printing, which, um, uh, you know, which usually they tend to be the ones that, that you want to throw in the garbage and everyone else uh, wants to get a hold of all the mistakes. But anyway, these, these color charts uh, are free to, for you to take, and it shows all the colors that we have at the lab, uh, if, you, you know, if you pick out one that's properly registered. On the flip side, it, uh, we have all our summer courses listed. So registration's open now. Um, for our classes, we're offering four Rezograph classes, including an intro class, a zine class, um, a mini comics class, and a new class taught by Paul John, or PJ, as some of you guys may know him of a publishing house, Endless Editions, um, focusing on design and photography. Um, so that's, that's about it for me for now. Um, the, so Natalie's gonna go first. Um, you know, our artists are gonna go one after the other and present their work. And at the, at the end, we'll have a QA and a um, and you'll have a chance to ask Natalie and Greg and also myself any questions you might have, have about their process, about their work, about Rezograph printing. Um, so, um, I'm going to introduce Natalie Andrewson, um, who's going to start off the evening. Uh, hold off, I'm going to just, you know, give you guys a little bit of back background on exactly who she is and what she does. Um, Natalie Andrewson is an illustrator and cartoonist, uh, currently living in Brooklyn, New York. Um, she's worked on various projects such as book covers, magazines and newspaper illustrations, animation backgrounds, comics and posters. She's currently working on her first large-scale graphic novel, which is an adaptation of the original Nutcracker story for the, for, for, uh, the publisher First Second. She self-publishes comics and prints at the SFA Rizzo Lab, where she was an artist in residence in the fall of 2016, as you guys know and you'll hear about. And she likes to show work at comic conventions across the world, um, such as TCAF in Toronto, SPX, LCAF, and Kaigai, Kaigai Manga Festa in Tokyo, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, and so if you guys want to give a warm welcome to Natalie Anderson. Young or you know, just becoming just like starting my career was really important and has totally like totally shaped what I wanted to do. Um, and uh, so after school I went back home. I knew I wanted to come to New York eventually, but I needed to save some money. Um, and so I did like odd jobs, I did some editorial work, but it really took a long time for me to like build up um, like my, my uh, publishers and my like clients um, in order to gain some confidence in other art directors to work with them. So like it was really a snowball effect. Um, and then I was able to move to New York in uh, like mid-2014, or in March 2014. Um, and uh, because I had like been doing all these small jobs and saving so much money by staying at home, I was able to focus on um, creating stories in my spare time. Um, and I, that was always a, a big part of what, um, of keeping I always wanted to make sure I spent time on that. I like saved some time for story um, like ideation. Um, my first self-published comic was called Man Atlanta, and I brought it to SPX uh, after I graduated. Um, and SPX is a small press expo. It's uh, right outside of Washington, D.C., and it's a huge um, comics festival for uh, yeah, again, similar to TCAF, um, small publishers, uh, 
and it's, it's just like a really good mix of people, of really kind people. So I was bringing around this comic, giving it to people that I... Um... Cool, thank you, Pan, and thanks, Nathan, for having us out today. Um, this program has been like incredible for me. So overall, thank you. Um, cool, uh, and yeah, thanks for coming out uh, on this like disgusting turned wonderful day. Um, I was in thunder, a thunderstorm earlier trying to get here, so it's pretty great that you guys came out. Um, so my name is Natalie, and I've been um, working in comics and illustration for about four years now, um, since I gra graduated in 2000, or uh, 13, so three years. Um, or f yes, four years. <laughs> anyway, um, and um, uh, let me just go through quick bio. Um, I graduated uh, from school in 2013. I went to Ringling College of Art and Design. Um, and uh, comics weren't a huge part of my school. I know that you guys are most, um, if you guys are students here, there's like a comics program. But at Ringling, it was just illustration, and you really had to get into it um, yourself if you wanted, if you were interested. And so in 2000, like late 2013, when uh, I was about to graduate, me and my friend Ren asked for money to go up to TCAF because we were curious about what this cool indie publishing um, uh, convention was about. And it's um, in Toronto, and it's this beautiful festival with um, really incredible uh, self-publishers, small publishers, um, work that is just really nicely curated. Um, and so getting to, to see that when I was super 